seems like Priscilla sometimes the wife um, is the more the more verbal leader. So I, I have a sense that this is a three-way conversation with all three of them there present. Might have been multiple conversations over a series of uh, days or weeks or months, but Priscilla and Aquila together as a couple took Apollos under their wing to mentor him and to guide him in the way. Awesome. Now I'm going to look at it. I'm going to say this, uh, and I could be completely wrong, but it seems like Priscilla was so in tune with her faith and so in tune, you know, with her heart in Christ that when she spoke, she knew what she was talking about. And the husband Aquila probably didn't have to correct her as much because she was already there, if you will. You get what I'm saying? Well, one thing that we, yeah, one thing we know about this couple is that they seem to be almost everywhere. And when I say that, here, here's what I mean. It, it, it seems that they were super connected with the early church. You know, we're talking about the very formative days of the New Testament church here, where churches are being planted. Almost everything that's being done is, is pure missionary work. But they were certainly connected because uh, they left Rome, right, when they're kicked out under Emperor Claudius, and they go to Corinth. But later on in the next chapter, chapter 19, they show up in the church of Ephesus. So there's two churches right there, Corinth and Ephesus. We have books of the Bible called Corinthians and Ephesians. And then Paul mentions them in his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he mentions them. So Timothy knew who Priscilla and Aquila was. And then get this, here's the kicker. At the end of the book of Romans, when Paul has this list of people that he's uh, saying to greet, uh, they come up again. So apparently Priscilla and Aquila are known also to the Romans, who Paul hadn't even met yet personally, because in Romans he's writing to really introduce his theology to that church. Hmm. So Priscilla and Aquila, they, are, they just seem to be everywhere. And what what we think is happening here is that they are super committed to the work of church planting. And even though uh, they're not as well known as Paul, they seem to have their um, their shadow being cast everywhere and their influence affecting very many people. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Now, I, yeah, I, I want to really get is. I want to take a look at uh, Heidi or churchmanship real quick. So. Matt, do you think that Priscilla and Aquila's actions was something elders are called to do when they hear or see someone, you know, saying something wrong, doing something wrong in the church? Uh, should elders bring this type of behavior to the person who said it or did um, or did the action? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um so th this is a model of what elders would would do because as I mentioned, their heart is clearly in the local church, and they're clearly leaders within the local church. In fact, it says in one place um, that there's a church that's meeting in their home. So whichever home that is, uh, they're, they're having meetings in their house. They're doing as much as they can. But here's what I like about this scene. Um, when, when you read the text carefully, it says they took Apollos aside to explain the way of God more clearly to him. And I really like that language because that's a very gentle type of correction. When you take somebody aside, why would you why would you take them aside? Well, because you don't want to embarrass that mm -hmm. person. Right. Um, you can imagine a scenario where somebody makes a mistake or or states something just slightly inaccurately, and somebody could you know jump all over you about oh that's wrong or that's false or you got that wrong. Uh, that's what we do on social media is we jump all over each other and just clobber each other for for making mistakes in doctrine or, you know, our biblical interpretation. But this idea of taking them aside is just gentle and patient and corrective and restorative. And so that's exactly what uh, elders should be doing is helping to train young pastors but doing so in a way that is just affirming and careful and corrective and very, very helpful. And so I like the fact that um, both the couple and the pastor actually come off looking pretty good here in this passage, because Apollos, he doesn't take correction in a bad way. You know, sometimes when we're corrected, we get offended, 
or we get defensive. But Apollos apparently takes the correction very well, and Priscilla and Aquila give the correction very gently, and so that's a that's a recipe for success. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and sometimes you don't have pastors that you know take correction pretty well. Anyway, mm-hmm. so now this one's for the listeners. If you're in a small group, uh, I want you to discuss this question. So the question is, how you ever, oh, I'm sorry, have you ever been taken aside in order to have something explained to you more accurately as Priscilla and Aquila did with Apollos? How did you react? Um, were you as gracious uh, as these three acted in Acts 18, 24 to 28? Now, since you're the listener discussing the question, my question is going to be directed toward Matt. Has that ever happened to you? Well, I think that if you're a pastor or a teacher and you speak publicly on a regular basis, it's not going to be long before somebody corrects you on some fact, matter, point, or opinion. And um, that's going to happen to everybody. And, um, you know, that's a good thing if we take it to be a good thing. Now, as I mentioned before, there are times where If you get corrected on a particular point of doctrine, our tendency, because we're very prideful sinners, (laughs) for myself here, (laughs) we're very prideful people. When somebody corrects us, our normal posture is to defend what we said rather than to heed the correction. And I think this is why Apollos is so wise, because he does not do that. Um, Now, I've certainly, as a pastor, been corrected many times. And um, not so much lately as when I was a when I was a younger pastor. Um, I used to get emails. I used to get letters or cards. Um, <laughs> some of them were worded worded much more kindly than others were worded. But uh, to be a pastor or a, or a teacher, you're putting yourself out there, and you're you're kind of exposing yourself for the world to see when you when you preach. It's very it's very self. Uh, self-revealing, and it's very humble and, um, you know, kind of a, it's a position in which you're exposing yourself to critique. So, yeah, it hurts a little bit, but yeah. you and have to ask yourself, is this for my good? Yeah, and I've been, you know, dabbling in the pulpit just for announcements, and I was corrected by my pastor, which was pretty mm-hmm. good. I'm glad he did it. But I'm starting to look at the pastorate as, you pastor a flock and they in return pastor you. So mm-hmm, it's like mm-hmm. a dialogue between you and the congregation. If you say something that is either unbiblical or needs more clarification, they'll let you know. And then you correct that. And then, you know, it's, it's like a ongoing dialogue between you and the mm-hmm. congregation or the pastor and the congregation. Mm-hmm. So just think about that question yeah. closely. Now, uh, so, We come to this parallel of Lydia, we talked about her last week, and the godly couple, married couple, Aquila and Priscilla. What are advantages and disadvantages of working together as a married couple like Priscilla and Aquila? And what are some advantages of being single like Lydia, Paul, and Jesus, and myself? (laughs) Yeah. Well, there's obviously great advantages to both, and that's why both singleness and the state of marriage are commended in Scripture. Uh, we can look to a passage like 1 Corinthians 7, for instance, and realize that Paul has words of exhortation both for married couples and for, for single persons. So um, starting with the single people first, you know, one of the, what we can say about single people, that's an advantage, like Paul, is that single persons have a measure of freedom uh, that a married couple might not ordinarily have. So when I say freedom, I mean freedom in terms of um, a freedom of time, freedom, freedom of scheduling, uh, freedom of being able to, to be more mobile in your calling. Um, if you are a single person and you decide to move, for instance, across the country or to a different city, there's less entanglements um, than a married couple might have and, and being able to do that, especially if you're a person that does not have children. Um, you can stay up late if you want. You can get up early if you want. Yep. You can work 48 hours straight if you want to or uh, crash for three days on the weekend. I mean, um, there's a great 
flexibility and advantage of singleness. And I think that's why the Apostle Paul stayed single, because he needed to have the freedom to move about the, the known world at that time, constantly putting his life in, in risk and in jeopardy for the sake of the gospel. And if you're a married person who has to provide for, for children or for a family, then you can't quite take on as much risk and mobility and, and freedom as a single person might have because of the responsibilities that are incumbent upon a married person. Now, even while there's a, some advantages to singleness, and like you said, Lydia, as far as we know, was single. Um, Jesus, of course, our Lord and Savior, was a single man. Uh, Paul, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel was a widower. His wife died. Lots of great single people in the scriptures. Uh, but marriage has some great advantages, too. Uh, one of the advantages of marriage is that you have somebody who can comfort you in times of affliction. You have a partner to help you think through some of the difficulties and challenges of, of life. Um, I have a friend the other day, we were just talking, he's a single dad, and just talking about how difficult it is at times to uh, even make decisions related to the children or your taxes or your employment without having somebody to talk to about those things. Um, and married people at least have that advantage of of having a life partner that's at least theoretically standing side by side with them throughout all the difficulties of life. Right, right. Now, <laughs> I'm gonna throw this in there. Cultural wise, uh, if you look at today's the breakdown of today um, and the lack mm -hmm. of, well, it's not really a lack of married people, but um, just the other day, I, uh, I dealt with a complaint where. Uh, this 81 and 83 year old married couple um, was going through a little small issue where the husband is, uh, has a, uh, I think early set dementia and mm -hmm. she was trying to get him to go to bed and he wouldn't go to bed. Well, when I was talking to her, she's like, you know, I don't want to put him in a home. We've been married for 61 years. And mm -hmm. I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, 61 years, you know, looking at the culture today, Hardly no one values marriage that long anymore. Now, I'm not saying yeah. you won't, Matt. I mean, obviously, you're going to try your best to keep that going. But, you know, when I look at Aquila and Priscilla, they were, I'm going to use the word, they were a beast, you know, as a married couple. They, mm -hmm. <laughs> they did everything together, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And I'm hoping and praying that we can, as a country, as a nation, or as a world, go back to that. That system of marriage, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I wish I was married, you know, but women can't handle me. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another topic. You know, here's, here's something to think about, Brandon, for those, those of you who are listeners out there in the podcast world. Um, you probably know Christians, right? You know some Christians in the church. You've got some good examples that are men. You've got some good examples that are women. And you probably know a lot of people that serve Christ in the church and in various ministries, whatever that ministry would be. But have you ever noticed how few married couples actually serve together in their ministry? You know, it seems so often that maybe the man does this thing, he teaches this study or that study, uh, the woman is involved in this ministry or the other. But it, it seems so often that... Um, that couples, even when they do serve, they don't serve together. And I wish I could see that a little bit more often. I wish I could see husbands and wives serving in the same ministry side by side, going on the same mission trips, uh, serving in the same Sunday school class rather than just the one spouse or the other teaching it. It almost seems like it's pretty rare to see a couple that's actually doing ministry together side by side a lot. Right. And that's why I mentioned that couple Andy and Jody – uh, from, that I knew from Florida, my Florida church, because they did so much together. They started this homeless feeding ministry, just the two of them, and wow. it really caught on in our church. They would make these meals. They'd take them out to the homeless in the city. There was a ton of homeless in Brooksville, and uh, Jody would help prepare the food, and then Andy would take it out, and sometimes uh, the other way around. It was just awesome to see them actually doing the same ministry at the same time. And it made me think of how rare that is, sadly, in the church. Yeah. Uh, to see couples actually doing the same stuff. 
And I think if, if we had more of that, it would strengthen the church.